gonna get left in the dust by you other book reviewers when you have reviews for the long list of books that we've never heard of 40 seconds after they announced them. So the book a long list got announced, I made a reaction to it where I basically said, I, I don't know, bro, I, I don't know. Uh, and I decided to only read the ones that sounded interesting to me from the blurbs initially, and also from some of the writers. Uh, so I've got a list of like four or five I want to read before the shortlist comes out, and then I'll definitely read the shortlist. So hopefully I, I, I read some that get shortlisted, that would be nice. <laughs> Um, but one of the ones that sounded interesting from the blurbs was this book, Pearl, by Sean Hughes. And boy was I fucking wrong! <laughs> uh, I read this because the blurb sounded interesting. It was talking about, um, medieval poems being used to, uh, like, like, process grief. And I was expecting something stylishly written, like maybe The Wake, but set in modern day. Um, but what I got was an incredibly disengaged, passive reading experience. I would compare this book pretty reasonably to Stillborn from the International Booker shortlist. That book had nothing that interested me, but it achieved some of the goals uh, for other people. This book does have some interesting things to me, uh, Pearl, but it uh, completely fails at like executing them or showing them in a way that affected me, uh, apart from maybe the end. I thought the idea of channeling a medieval poem to process grief, that sounded like a really interesting idea, but it might as well have just been a fucking Ruby Cower poem, and it would not have changed the book at all. The book would not have changed if it was a milk and honey quote, uh, because it's barely utilized in the book. It comes in about a quarter of the way through, and then it doesn't really matter. And I know some people will argue, well, actually, the, the themes and topics of the book are in it th throughout the whole thing. All right, my main issue with this book is that it is a total kaleidoscope. The the middle, like, 80% of this book jumps around so fucking frenetically, and there's no real sense of flow to it. It's it's about someone going through their memories, but the way they go through their memories is like no other fucking person you've, you've ever heard of. I get that there's this tendency in writers to imagine memory as something that is, like, very jumpy, because you're thinking and it's non-linear. It makes sense that it might be non-linear, because you're thinking about one thing, and then you're thinking about another thing. I can't say in my head that I've thought, or had the thought process, any near the way that this woman does. It's fucking crazy. She's just like fucking, like, she, apparently so much has happened in her life and she's able to recall it in so many different ways. It's fucked. She's processing not having a mother anymore, but it's so scattershot uh, that you can barely process the images that are speeding past you, full speed ahead, going right past you like a fucking greyhound. This book, Pearl, is like a non-linear autobiography for someone you've never heard of and it never did anything more to engage me from that premise I had in my head. It just kind of flows from memory to memory, but a lot of those memories I knew would not feel crucial or important, and by the end they did not. So it's just the, like, this completionist view where you have to put every detail in, um, to like emphasize a certain scene and it was totally unnecessary and I don't know why she did it the way she did But I think if she boiled it down more it would be worse because then it would literally just be a fucking uh, Dot point list out of order of what happened to her. So I don't know I guess don't write the book I fucking know a lot of the observations on the mother in question that she's remembering about were very surface level and especially cliche Here's one good example. I took um, she's talking about how her mother told her not to do something and she says I must have believed my mother had supernatural powers of sight and hearing. I feel like I've heard everybody call their mum that. Say, wow, you have like Vulcan hearing, holy shit, like you're, you're so, you're, you came out of nowhere, that's so impressive, you always know when I'm gonna do something wrong, teehee. I know I've said stuff like that to my mum before, but it was like so cliche to read it. <laughs> I wish there was something a little bit more unique to the characterization of the mother. There are points where the author tries to make it seem like her mother wasn't this golden perfect image that she has in her head, which would be the point, right? If you're if you're remembering your parental figure in a way where you're trying to dispel an image, kind of like the movie After Sun, then it would make sense to do it sort of jumping around, because then you can kind of solve mysteries that lead up to the end. Um, but this book doesn't, it does it like a couple of times, but for the most part, the image of her mother as being this like golden goddess stays. Her mother is like, tucks her into bed at night and reads to her and she's great at cooking and maybe when she sings at the windowsill all the birds come and sit with her, like fuck. It's, it was such a like, boring um, a picture we had of the mother in her head, and any attempt she made to try and subvert that did not last because again, these images are passing by you at full speed. There's a point where it's implied the mother had an affair with someone, but fuck it, never mention again, just keep going, just keep fucking speed running, like it's, it's, this book isn't any percent speed run. I'd like to provide Cold Enough for Snow as an example of a book uh, that is extremely personal and extremely rooted in memory, but does not feel like it's saccharin, and it, and it, um, it's more detached, and I think I prefer a detached observational style to what we get here. That's just something I prefer. Um, if, if it was more... 
I don't know, I just feel like it, it was sitting in its head for so long, and it, and again, it jumped around so much that at any point where the emotion did come through and work, all I was thinking about was, that came out of nowhere, that was not earned, like, it was not earned when you have nothing and then random, like, chunks appear of good stuff. That doesn't, that doesn't count. It does have flashes of interest and, and excellent writing in there, but they are swamped by everything else. I did not get enough proof that this writer was good. <laughs> every chapter begins with a nursery rhyme and there's absolutely no reason for it. If you're gonna do that for every single chapter heading, there needs to be a reason and it needs to link into the chapter maybe that you're doing that in, but I can't say that it did. I think she ran out of nursery rhymes and she had to just fucking kind of pass them up. There are a couple of points where the nursery rhyme does fit into the content of the chapter, although I really have to focus to figure out what the content of an individual chapter is, um, but sometimes it doesn't and I know that it didn't because there's only so many nursery rhymes and she had to fucking make them all fit. So every single chapter begins with a nursery rhyme and I guess the only reason for that is because it's about a kid who liked getting read nursery rhymes. That's not a good enough reason to include that in every fucking chapter. I'm sorry, it's not. It's not a good enough reason. It's not like I was offended by the book or anything. I, 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 I this was not like pod or something to me. Um, uh, it's just not something that I found interesting after about the halfway point. I was really checked out and it was, I, as I said, very disengaging and passive. I cannot say that her memories of her mother were so unique or revolutionary in the way she told- well, it was revolutionary in the way she told them because I could not fucking understand them. So that is revolutionary unless she's following in the trend of some postmodernist authors I don't like. <laughs> there are moments that are good, as I said, there are moments where I was really focusing on the writing and I was focusing on, um, the- the- the perspective we were viewing it through. I liked some of that. Uh, the ending 30 or 40 pages, they're really good. Um, it's basically like the beginning, the opening memory, the first 20 pages or so, that was pretty good, but I didn't know what I was getting in for. And then the last 30 or 40 pages where it wraps up and it actually wraps up, it doesn't just fucking open end it, which would be fine if it did that, but it does wrap up. Um, I kind of loved the ending and that improved it a lot for me. I was sitting on a 4 out of 10 and then the ending kind of pushed it up, if I'm being honest. It, it, it was a lot more driven by that point. And again, as I said, the structure's really wishy-washy and it just kind of fucking blends everything together and there's no kind of cohesion to it. If it was out of order and non-linear, that's fine, but it needs to be cohesive. It needs to fit together. Like, th the reason that the, um... Like, any memory that's in chapter 11 could be in chapter 2. This is like, it's like fucking Naked Lunch. Like, there's no reason for it to be in the order it, it's in. But the fact that it's in the order it's in does not make it any better than if it were in a different order. The order she's chosen for the memories to appear in is not, it, it doesn't feel like it has a, like a, a, like a connection to it. It doesn't feel like a storyline develops. Meanwhile, that ending is very conclusive and wraps up a lot of the themes and the fairy tale stuff and it, and it puts a lot of the metaphors that you've been seeing and it kind of finalizes each of them, and I thought it did that very sort of economically, and I was shocked that it did that, because then I went, where the fuck was this the entire rest of the book? There's a moment near the end where the mum tells her a story about a princess in a tower, and that's a really effective moment when she kind of ends the chapter talking about that poem and how it kind of, it, it doesn't really apply to her now. Um, that was good, but then I realized, wait, this whole story thing came out of nowhere. Like, when you start reading back the book, you realize that things appear. The, 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 the sort of, um more emotional moments, they just kind of rise out of nowhere and then they disappear again. And it's a really weird way to structure a book. Right, so what happened was I finished the book and I went, wow, that ending was really emotional and powerful and poignant. So then I decided to skip back to a random chapter in about the middle and try and read through it and see if I get anywhere near the same emotion or the same kind of building feeling um, that I got when the ending finish it, because the ending implied that stuff was building, so I wanted to read back and see if that was actually true. So here we go, just try- I, I read chapter 9 again for context, which I mentioned about the gardener. Here we go. So chapter 9 begins, it has the nursery rhyme, Epa Weeper Chimney Sweeper, but like the nice version of it, not the one where the chimney sweeper fucking murders someone. And then it talks about a fortune-telling book the mother gave the main character. Then that transitions into her being questioned by the cops. I, this dot point is so funny. Then she wonders whether her mum left her a note again. Then it turns into a discussion of how her mum might have had an affair with the gardener Stan, or maybe not. Then she shuts down the rumours that the bored reader might have had that she's not her father's daughter. Like I care. Oh, sorry, you thought something interesting was gonna happen, but no, no, no. Uh, and like, nobody, nobody gave a fuck. And then it ends with talking about nothing for two pages, and then that's the end of the chapter. The conclusion is forced and great and profound, and the middle is just 
Like, like I said, the way that I described it, the way that I described it is how it comes across in the book. It's not like the connections are there. The way I described it is how it comes across in the book. How does Epa Weeper Chimney Sweeper uh, relate to the mother's affair with the gardener? How does the fact that the mum gave her a fortune telling book matter to the idea that she had an affair with the gardener? Why does her possibly being her father's daughter, but perhaps not, how does that matter to the rest of the book? It never gets mentioned again. Um, f like, fuck you. Like, why, why are you wasting my time? So here's a quote from near the end. Sometimes I forget all about my mother. Whole days go by and I think about other things. Things that leave no space for her absence. I do it on purpose. I fix my mind on other things. When I'm drawing or painting, I forget all about her. I forget about everything. So that's the structural justification for why the book is the way it is. And I love, I really do love books where structure is a big part of delivering the theme. Like Ninth Building is a really good example of that. American Psycho is always the example I'll jump to first. Um, I love books where structure is part of it, but I didn't feel like in these sections that the characterization was particularly great or that the themes were particularly new or that the writing was like so incredible apart from a few key moments and I felt like the jumping around was giving too much credit to a uh, perspective and voice that I did not care about. I've been reading Solenoid, the Mircea Ciotarescu book, and that book jumps around for no reason, but it's it's hypnotic, it's constantly engaging. I've never read a book like that. I'm not going to review Solenoid here. That's going to be a long ass review. But I I can't say that this book was engaging me. It just was not. And it, it, the fact that it was jumping around and doing the structure, I can respect, but I can't enjoy it. Um, I can just sort of respect the fact that it did kind of commit to the idea of what it wanted to do in terms of how it treated memory. But I don't feel like it, it did it in a way where I was really like moved by it until the end where it, it kind of implied things that weren't there. Somehow 230 pages was too long for it. Cold Enough for Snow, that book I mentioned earlier, that's about half the length. And that does a lot more than this book does and it makes you feel more. I can't believe 230 pages was too long for a book, but fuck, I, my eyes were uh, going sideways. The Medieval Poem Connection did not matter, as I said, it was bait. It was bait, the book is not about that. It might be higher on a reread now that I know how it ended, because again, most of the middle chunk I was not paying attention. If there were connections between them, I could not care less because it was not interesting me. But I'm not rushing to reread it. If it gets on the shortlist, then I will. People seem to think that it will. The betting odds, the bookie odds for the booker that have opened now, they put this book at like third place, which is crazy to me. Um, but I mean, it's not impossible. It is trying things that are new. It has a female perspective. I could see it being on the shortlist and I would kind of just be like, eh, whatever. I like Stillborn more than this. I found this book very tedious, um, and I and I was annoyed at how much it didn't seem to justify the frenetic uh, pace that it was going at. I give it a five out of 10. It could be lower or higher, depending on uh, when or if I reread it, but for the moment, I think five is fair. Uh, total, total meh. Um, can't say it was awful, but I can't say any of it was particularly great to me. Sorry! So, the next books I'm gonna read, I'm reading In Ascension right now, and apparently I'm the only person on Earth who likes that book, so that's gonna be a fun one. Uh, I read Old God's Time, I'm gonna read that Study for Obedience book, uh, because it sounded interesting, and also uh, gotta, gotta rep the boy uh, from Scotland. There's a couple of books that looked funny that I wanna read. I wanna read that All the Little Bird Hearts book. Very funny title. Um, I might read that if I can find it cheap, but other than that, I will not be touching some of these books unless someone pays me. Like, I'm not going near them. Sorry. I, I will see. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, we'll have more reviews coming. I'm very busy for the next three months or so, so my my videos are going to be few and far between. But then after about uh, November 1st, I'll, I'll get through them all. I'll get through the shortlist. I'll do everything. So I, I just wanted to review this first, and I'll, I'll have some more coming out as we go. But thanks. Goodbye.